entertainment highlights for BBC One on Sunday night at 7.15 Mastermind and the last place of this year's final is at stake as the four contenders face more rapid-fire questions from Magnus Magnuson. Then at 7.45, Alan Howard, Michael Gambon, Patrick Stewart and Mike Willem star in The Holy Experiment. Set in 18th century South America, it tells of a group of Jesuits torn between their vows of obedience to authority and the dictates of conscience. I cannot do it, Father. There's nothing that a Jesuit cannot do. You will inform him that my orders have been obeyed. When we're ordered to commit a sin, our vows do not compel obedience. I have commanded you to commit a sin. You have a mortal sin. At 9.20, that's Life is Back. To test a new French delicacy on the streets of Glasgow, to meet Jennifer Hartzorn, who springs the romantic surprise of the week. Three top programmes for Sunday night on BBC One. Well, over on BBC Two shortly, the tercentenary of the birth of Domenico Scarlatti is celebrated with a performance of his work and a journey through the world he wrote it for. Here on BBC One in 15 minutes, Match of the Day features highlights from the games between Liverpool and Newcastle and Oxford United and Oldham Athletic. On BBC One now, though, the news and today's sport. Chelsea's plan for an electrified fence is condemned by the sports minister. He calls it a step too far. But the club's chairman says he'll ignore the minister who he says should resign. Agreements just been reached in the dispute which started the Midlands postal strike. Baby Edwin celebrates his first birthday after 15 operations to rebuild his heart. And England let it slip again at Cardiff. Chelsea Football Club have dismissed the widespread condemnation of their plans to install an electrified fence round their pitch. Labour attacked it as degrading and dehumanising. The sports minister, Neil McFarlane, called it a step too far. In reply, Chelsea's chairman, Ken Bates, said he would ignore the minister who should resign. Some opponents of electrification have questioned the fence's legality, but Chelsea say the police have approved it. Chelsea's existing fence will be topped off with extra barbed wire and a final wire carrying the 12-volt charge, designed, say the club, to give a short, sharp shock. It's planned to be in operation for next Saturday's match against London rival Spurs. Chelsea were playing away today at West Bromwich Albion. From there, Paul McRae. More than 100 miles from their home ground, there were plenty of reminders for the Chelsea fans of their outspoken chairman's new approach to preventing pitch invasions. Unless some idiot actually wants to climb the fence to get on the pitch, nothing will happen. If he does, if he touches it, he'll get a shot. After all, aren't they, didn't the politicians say that uh, what the offenders needed was a short, sharp shock treatment? Well, they're going to get one. Mr Bates' action follows trouble at Stamford Bridge last month when hooligans ran riot, assaulting a player. The club was ordered to improve its fencing, but there's a feeling among politicians it's gone too far. I would have thought that good perimeter fencing can be effective enough. So on balance I am very surprised and I think that it is uh, a regrettable step for our national game. In certain quarters, and that is also governmental quarters, they're wanting to make clubs absolutely responsible for what is happening on their grounds. And uh, clubs, accordingly, have got to take every step they can possibly think of to avoid that sort of trouble. Wherever Chelsea fans travel, the police turn out in force. More officers than usual were on duty at West Bromwich, where methods of crowd control will remain traditional. The London supporters, though, are less than impressed with what will be in store for them at Stamford Bridge. Well, I don't think people are calling the fans to get electrocuted, but then again, they're treating us like cattle, yeah. doing things like that. Yeah. It's all right if you've got rubber gloves on, isn't it? When you get a part like this in the season, most of the fans ain't coming to the games anyway. All well, your ones who came against Sunderland, they're other. They don't support Chelsea. Well, you know, all your troubles outside the ground, isn't it? Why fans inside the ground? The post office and the postal union say they've reached agreement on the dispute in Northampton, which brought up to 30,000 postmen out on strike and delayed 30 million letters. The two sides spent six hours in talks before announcing the agreement, which calls for a return to work from Sunday night. It still has to be approved by a mass meeting in Northampton tomorrow. The strike began there as a dispute about overtime payments. It spread to other areas as the post office tried to divert blocked mail. Well, we've reached an agreement that I believe that the local officials can put to our local branches 
tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock. Do you think this will mean a return to work on Monday then? I hope so, but it will be a decision for the uh, branches concerned to make, uh, to make a decision whether or not they're prepared to go back to work immediately. I believe it's a fair agreement, an honourable agreement, and I'm, I'm prepared to leave it on that basis. The IRA say they were responsible for an attack on a part-time member of the Ulster Defence Regiment at his home in Ballycastle, County Antrim, early this morning. He was shot in the neck, but he's not badly hurt. And in Newry, the IRA planted an incendiary bomb which caused a small fire in a restaurant which had been used by Northern Ireland Secretary Douglas Hurd on a recent visit to the town. No one was hurt. The President of the North Atlantic Assembly, Conservative MP Sir Patrick Wall, says he'll fly to Belgium on Monday following the bomb attack on the Assembly's Brussels headquarters this morning. Sir Patrick says he'd warned the Belgians of the dangers of a terrorist attack. There were no serious injuries in the explosion, but the 200-pound bomb caused extensive damage to the offices of the Assembly, which is a parliamentary group linked to NATO. Later, a previously unknown terrorist organisation calling itself the Revolutionary Front for Proletarian Action said it was responsible. The bomb was the latest in a series of attacks on NATO targets in Belgium. In South Africa's Eastern Cape, a coloured woman and her three-year-old son have been burnt to death at Kirkwood, a township near Port Elizabeth. The woman was attacked by a group of black youths who later set fire to her house, badly injuring two more of her children. The West German government have denied blocking moves by the White House to change President Reagan's plan for a visit to a German war cemetery where members of the SS are buried. The president's run into stormy opposition over a wreath-laying ceremony at Bitburg Cemetery on May the 5th, shortly before the 40th anniversary of the Allied victory in Europe. And he recently decided to visit the Belsen concentration camp as well. But this hasn't stemmed the flood of protests from Jewish organisations about the visit to Bitburg. More than 2,000 soldiers are buried in this German cemetery, but there are no Allied graves here. West Germany's Chancellor Kohl saw Bitburg as an ideal place to mark reconciliation with Germany's former enemies 40 years on. But somehow, no one checked the headstones properly. Tucked away in a corner of the cemetery are the graves of 47 former SS men, members of the elite Nazi force that carried out Hitler's program of extermination of the Jews. The graves include those of a former Gestapo officer who may also have worked in concentration camps and of an SS man decorated for killing 10 American soldiers. Jewish critics say it's an insult for President Reagan to visit a cemetery with SS graves. Nevertheless, Chancellor Kohl expects the trip to Bitburg to take place. Speaking on television, he said, I can well understand that the victims of the Nazis cannot forget the crimes committed in the name of Germany. For us, though, it's reconciliation at the graveside. Armenians in London have been marking the 70th anniversary of the events of 1915, when more than a million of them were killed or deported from their homeland in what's now eastern Turkey. Today, three million Armenians are dispersed throughout the world and they're pressing for the establishment of an independent Armenian state. The 10,000 Armenians now living in Britain remain loyal to a country that ceased to exist after the First World War. Most support peaceful protests to win international recognition, a goal they share with the terrorists whose attacks include the killing of seven people at Orly Airport in Paris and regular attempts on the lives of Turkish diplomats. They don't support the terrorists, but nor do they utterly condemn them. Most of their anger is directed at Turkey, but they delivered a letter to Mrs Thatcher calling on Britain to recognise the massacre. And at the Cenotaph, two of the survivors laid a wreath to the million and a half that they say died. Now, with news of a world marathon record, a football relegation issue settled and that continuing hoodoo on England's rugby players, here's Mark Austin. Yes, England's rugby union players kept their dismal record of not winning at Cardiff Arms Park since 1963 when they were beaten today by 24 points to 15. But England in white had their chances and took the lead with their only try. Here's a great chance for England. In goes Brain. Brain rescues. Along the line to Andrew, Dodge, Sims, there's several men here, Martin, out to Smith, Smith going for the line, his third try of the season for England. Then came repeated skirmishes between the two packs of forwards that kept referee Francis Palmade busy.
but with England ahead again, two second-half tries won the match for Wales. The first followed terrible play by fullback Chris Martin. Oh, and he's lost it, and the try has been given. Jonathan Davis, the standoff half. And what a blow for England's fullback Chris Martin. Billy James trying to work it from Perkins. Now it's Holmes. Davis. Davis goes outside his man. There's a real chance here, but the pass went behind Lewis. Pick up there by Hadley. Out to Hopkins. Lewis back inside to Pickering. Pickering. Beautifully tackled short. The try has been given now, and Wales surely are safe now. So Wales move above England in the final international table. Howard Kendall's Everton have continued their relentless drive to the First Division title. They beat Stoke at the Victoria ground today to go ten points clear of Manchester United with a game in hand. Their victory also condemned Stoke to Second Division football next season. Steve Lee reports. Stoke City are on course for the worst First Division performance in history, but early on Carl Saunders almost unsettled the league leaders. It didn't take long though for Everton to score. Berry misses Stevens' throw in and Graham Sharp finishes in style. Everton moved up a gear now. A lovely combination from Reed and Gray almost brings Sharp a second. Another throw in from Stevens just after the break leads to Everton's second. Sheedy making no mistake. Then a surging run from Stevens almost brings another goal. Sheedy's drive parried by Siddle. Then the game's most explosive incident. Stokes' young fullback Chris Masqueray clearly throwing a punch at Trevor Stephen. Amazingly, he escaped without even a caution. Everton fortunately kept their heads and created more chances, although it wasn't Andy Gray's day. But the championship now looks safe. Stoke nil, Everton two. There'll be news of the rest of today's football in match of the day or sports scene in Scotland immediately after this news. On the eve of the fifth London Marathon, a new world record has been set. In Rotterdam this afternoon, the Olympic champion Carlos Lopez of Portugal knocked almost a minute off the world record established by Britain's Steve Jones in the Chicago Marathon last October. Jones runs in tomorrow's event. In London, there was a late rush to register this afternoon, but the final total of 16,000 falls well short of expectations. The organisers say they're disappointed with the number of competitors. It will be the smallest turnout since 1981 when the marathon first started. They blame the bad winter for disrupting training and a flu bug which has taken its toll of the runners. The Prince and Princess of Wales are rounding off the first full day of their Italian tour with an evening at the opera. They're watching Puccini's Turandot at La Scala in Milan. This morning they were entertained by the Italian Navy after arriving at La Spezia naval base in the Royal Yacht, Britannia. Messing about in boats was the order of the day, and the port of La Spezia was crammed with a good chunk of the Italian Navy in honour of the Prince and Princess. Prince Charles in the uniform of a Royal Navy commander and the Princess in a hat possibly borrowed from the American Navy set off to review sea manoeuvres from the deck of the Italian's latest and smartest frigate. Obligingly, the Italian Navy whizzed across the pond-like sea and it roared through the air. And bearing flags, it plopped into the drink. If you're not quite sure about what exactly is going on, just ask an ex-sailor. Then time to try out one's Italian. Not much success there. And try out one's best signature. Little problem there too. But no trouble at all when it comes to the very grand occasion. A night out at La Scala in Milan. Diamonds, pearls and pink chiffon, though not a new creation, whispered Milan's knowledgeable fashion editors. And it's to be hoped a comfortable chair in the royal box for three and a half hours of Puccini. 
When Edwin Borick was born a year ago, doctors didn't think he'd survive because his heart was so severely malformed. Now, 15 operations later, his heart has been completely rebuilt and he was allowed to go home to celebrate his first birthday. Peter Main reports. <laughs> doctors say it's a miracle that Edwin Borick is alive. He was born with the arteries leaving his heart the wrong way around and one of them was badly blocked. Now, after 15 operations, two involving open heart surgery, Edwin's well on the way to making a complete recovery. Just over a year old, he spent 50 weeks in hospital, mostly in intensive care. Now, at home with his parents, his mother recalled that ordeal. Unfortunately, I think your mind begins to forget the terrible hours that you sat and waited whilst you know that your son was on the surgeon's knife in the operating theatre. And I think nothing can replace that, those few hours sitting there just waiting to know whether he's going to pull through or not. Edwin still needs one more operation, to remove a device in his windpipe which helps him breathe. Until then, he can't cry or make much noise and has to have his throat cleared regularly with a special machine. Delighted by what the doctors have done for their son, Edwin's parents are now launching a charitable trust to find out why babies are born with major heart defects. That's all from Mark and me. Have a nice evening. Good night. Well, BBC One begins its coverage of this year's London Marathon at ten past nine tomorrow, following the field throughout the morning, and for an idea of the kind of weather they'll be running in, here's Bill Giles. Good evening to you. Well, it's a pretty cold day today, very much winter seen back again with these northerly wees pushing right the way down across the country. They brought some uh, uh, showers, they brought some snow showers to many places too, and in central parts of the country there, the temperature only got up to 4 or 5 Celsius in some of those showers, which was uh, some 15 or 20 degrees uh, Celsius lower than it was yesterday. Well, as far as tomorrow's concerned, really the weather isn't changing very much. We're into these cold northeasterlies still, and down in southeastern parts, of course in London they're running the marathon there and I would suggest it's probably going to be a better day for running than it will be for watching because it will be pretty cold. Well still a fair number of showers, still a little bit of uh, sleet and snow mixed in them too but as we go through the night many of them dying away although they'll continue I think near this eastern coast but in central and western parts becoming clearer so a pretty cold night of fairly widespread frost and even where I put on temperatures of one and two there there could well be a touch of ground frost but I think near the eastern coast particularly and in parts of the southeast temperatures probably staying just above freezing. Tomorrow then sunshine and showers in uh, in a nutshell I think most of the showers will be fairly light although in East Anglia and the southeast in particular there could still be one or two fairly heavy ones but as we go through the day on the western side you'll find most of the showers dying out so more in the way of sunshine. Nonetheless, a pretty cold day, I think, in most places. Highest temperatures around 10 Celsius, 50 Fahrenheit, and the coldest part near the east coast. That's it. Bye-bye. Tomorrow, the holy experiment, the story of a Jesuit mission in 18th century South America. 150 years ago, our Jesuit fathers labored to create this holy community. And by the day, it grows stronger. Soon, every Indian on this continent will come to Christ. But when the Jesuits' ideals conflict with the interests of the Spanish Empire, the Spanish king orders them to abandon their work. We will not betray the thousands of innocent souls that look to us for protection and hand them over to oppression and slavery. Give me your orders, Father. Consider carefully what you are doing, Father the Provincial. But remember, the only law that commands obedience here is that of the king. The only law that commands obedience here is that of God. The Conflict of Authority and Conscience in The Holy Experiment, starring Alan Howard, Michael Gambon, Patrick Stewart and Mike William, tomorrow at 7.45 on BBC One. The Saturday late film at 10.35 is The Onion Field, based on the highly successful novel ex-policeman Joseph Wombaugh wrote from a case in the Los Angeles police file. On BBC One First, Match of the Day.
Good evening and welcome to Match of the Day and I should warn you not to blink for the next 50 minutes because you'll miss a goal. It's that kind of programme. First, we'll show you Liverpool against Newcastle United. Don't reach outside, four the other way. Good save. Next, it's Oxford United on the threshold of the First Division against Oldham Athletic. Again, Oxford able to keep on the pressure. And Brock. Aldridge! Everton march on to go ten points clear at the top of the First Division and send Stoke down to the second. Spurs slip up at home yet again. And off the field, Chelsea chairman Ken Bates says Sports Minister Neil McFarlane should resign. So it's over to Anfield where Liverpool take on Newcastle United and although the points may not look particularly important, either side might well be grateful for them before the season ends. Your commentator is Barry Davis. To retain their European Cup is now Liverpool's cause. And the confidence and the voice of the Cup is unimpaired. The motto here has always been to look forward and today that means points against Newcastle for a high enough league position as insurance of a 22nd season in Europe. And Joe Fagan makes changes in his team. Kevin McDonnell is left out. Sammy Lee returns in midfield where he's joined by Mark Lawrenson. Gary Gillespie plays in his proper position at the back. And Steve Nicol replaces the injured Jim Beglin at fullback. Newcastle also need the points. A midweek home defeat by Coventry has left them rather too close to the relegation zone for comfort. But today they welcome back their new England man, Chris Waddle, who has missed the last four games because of a knee injury. Otherwise, their team is unchanged. The referee on a fine sunny afternoon is Gilbert Napthine of Loughborough. Now, the last time Newcastle won here at Anfield, their scorers were a hat-trick from George Robledo and the other goal scored by the late Ernie Taylor. 35 years ago since they've had a victory here. And the free kick given, although Glenn Roder's head was quite a long way down and Sammy Lee is not the tallest player on the park. I must say we have a rollicking atmosphere because Newcastle supporters are never reticent about making themselves heard and there are quite a few here this afternoon Martin Thomas George Riley ex of Watford well watched by Alan Hansen Nickel Walk. Good play by Nickel. Anderson shut the door. to take the corner Nickel in close attendance Lawrenson up wide of the penalty spot two on the near post there oh, in the near post area just reached by Riley Neil gone for the return Douglas played it beautifully covered by Kenny Walton Gillespie some concerted pressure now by Liverpool Walk, good climb, but no contact. Chris Waddle offering himself again at right back. Riley showed far too much of that. Waddle once more, and Beardsley is onside. A real opportunity for it. The ball will come down. Good challenge by Gillespie. But the problem for him was the ball would not come down. It hung a bit in the air. And Gillespie made up the ground to get in the challenge. And in the end, Bruce Grobola was left quite unconcerned. Well on by Darish. 
goalkeeper one touch goalkeeper Beardsley Brown Megson seems to find a few gaps says Gary Megson well hell indeed low cross went in front of Pat Hurd and was very, very well claimed by Bruce Grobola. Waddle. Rhoda. Better control from Riley. Free kick given against Walk. Four forward. Riley. And one by Hansen and Neil got a knock on the bridge of the nose, it seemed. Beardsley. Waddle, still three Newcastle players in the area and Neil down outside of it. Oh, he did well to get the cross in and nobody coming in on the far side. It was a really good cross by Chris Waddle. And really, with one fullback out of the play, it was a little surprising that Newcastle didn't think they could take a chance and get somebody to come up on the far post. But Neil in a real mess. Got a knock on the bridge of the nose as he went out with Riley and Hansen came in behind and won the ball. 